this. All right. So I guess we'll get started. I'll monitor uh, if folks are coming in and out and let them in as we go. But uh, hey, everybody, thank you uh, uh, for joining us. Uh, this ought to be a really fun discussion at a relevant time where I hope many students are looking for or are in the process of applying for jobs. So um, yeah, a couple things before we get started. Uh, this, uh, I'm Stephen Carnavali. I'm the program director and professor uh, for the Masters in Global Supply Chain Management. Uh, with us, we have uh, an awesome guest, which is Matt Culp. I'm going to let him introduce himself in a moment. But uh, what I do want to say is uh, this webinar is being brought to you by St. Ange, of course, which we're going to talk about, but it's also being brought to you by our uh, Masters in Global Supply Chain Management program. So it's a, it's a one-year program, 10 credits, um, that focuses on really the four core elements of supply chain management, maybe five, but plan, source, make, deliver, and sometimes return. And in each case, it's a STEM-designated uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, STEM-designated program, analytics, and global acumen uh, are interwoven throughout the whole course. Um, and it is, uh, it's been really successful so far. We are still taking applications and we're still admitting uh, for the fall, but, um, but it's, uh, it's been very exciting watching it grow. Uh, and we've gotten really positive feedback for a number of different employers in the area and things like that. So a big thanks to the master's program. I'm gonna hand it over to Matt to allow him to introduce himself and to say knowledge, Matt. All right, thanks, Stephen. Um, thank you everyone for taking some time uh, to listen to, to us this afternoon. Um, again, my name is Matt Culp and uh, my title is EVP and Managing Partner. So the EVP or Executive Vice President means that I have responsibility for one of St. Ange Company's three business units. Um, St. Ange has three business units. One is inside the four walls, the distribution center design for uh, processes and material handling. Um, a lot of industrial engineers and that's, that's my business unit. We have a supply chain strategy group that's a more of a higher level source point to point of consumption strategic consulting group. And they also do a lot of what we call network optimization um, for designing domestic and international transportation um, networks. And then our third business unit is healthcare and that handles primarily supply chain and process design for hospitals and healthcare complexes. So. Real applicable, I, I believe, to this program. And uh, I, I'm personally a 1995 graduate of RIT, um, industrial engineering. One of my professors at the time um, is now a, uh, I believe, the dean of the business school and ran into her while I was at a recruiting fair, a career fair. And I've been recruiting from the IE department for about eight years now um, with a lot of success. Uh, but uh, Dr. Moserl said I should talk to Stephen and learn about this group and this, this program. And after my first conversation, I was really impressed. I uh, love, we're going to get into the analytics and the approach and the program. And, um, you know, that, that, that week made arrangements to come up and, and speak to some students and recruit from them. And we just hired our first student out of uh, Dr. Carnival's program. So real excited to make that connection and, and, and for the years going forward. So, that's who I am, who St. Ange Company is. Um, I should mention that our tagline is we're supply chain engineering consultants. So anything within the supply chain, we are engineers first. And so we list it before consultants, but we are consultants in that it's a professional services firm. We only sell our hours. And so people hire us to help them make better decisions. And with the engineering focus, a lot of it is data focused um, and better decisions through data analytics is, is a core of what we do. So that that is who St. Ange is, where I fit in, and, and how St. Ange and this program got connected. Fantastic. And I think uh, everything that you just said is probably the perfect segue into uh, what we're going to chat about today. So uh, the whole theme, the big picture theme for this is uh, what is it going to take in the in the next you know 10 15 years in order to be a successful supply chain management professional uh, and I hope we hit on skill sets I hope we hit on mindset I hope we hit on a number of different things but uh, let's start off with the most general sense when uh, 
And my goal, by the way, is to have you hire only supply chain students, but that's, you know, you can still look at the <laughs> IE if you want, that's okay, but only supply chain is my goal. Um, but when you're looking at it from uh, that standpoint, what, um, what do you look for as a hiring manager in a potential employee? What are some top level things that you focus on when you're making that decision? We, we have done uh, personality assessments. We've done uh, you know, some studies on, on what makes people successful at our company. And there are certain traits that we then identified and, and come up with a, a interview process to really identify those people. And, and some of those traits are uh, intellectual curiosity is, is a big one. And, and people that just want to ask more questions, understand why things are the way they are. And then the second one would be problem solving skills or an analytical or logical mindset. So we, you know, we look for that the DMAIC model to, to define a problem, measure it, analyze it, improve it, and then how to control it and circle back to the uh, define the problem again, or that, that plan do check cycle. We look for answers in the interview process to demonstrate that, that type of mindset. And then of course, the, the intellectual curiosity is important and the analytical mindset's important. Um, the skills to analyze data, especially coming out of the school, um, to work with large data sets. Uh, big data is a relative term, but the data sets are getting bigger and bigger. So we look for those skills, uh, database um, analytical skills, and then certainly um, interpersonal or communication skills and uh, the, the ability to you know, communicate um, what you're seeing. Um, out of those results, both internally and to the client. So there's a lot of ones we look at, but I'd say those three are our top ones. So th for you though, um, because you have multiple divisions, uh, the way that you hire, let's say you were to be hiring somebody for uh, the strategy division or the healthcare division, the, if I'm hearing you correctly, the common theme, those are three common things across those areas, but then when you focus in on a specific pain, at that point, the topical expertise would come in, right? So any experience with healthcare would be good, but doesn't matter because as long as they're intellectually curious, good at um, problem solving and analytically focused, then you can mold them into the into each of the silos. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right, um, especially out of college, so college grads. So certainly the reason we've had success at places like RIT, uh, Purdue, Clemson, um, and maybe less so at some other schools that I don't have to name, but is the, the co-op program. Um, there's a lot of really smart um, people out there um, and, and the, the co-ops and the experience do help those resumes to float to the top. And then the ability to develop those interpersonal and, and communication and just real world skills on those co-ops um, and be able to speak topically uh, with some of the buzzwords in other language um, certainly helps to separate in our process. We'll, we'll look at, I believe, five to 600 resume submittal, submittals every, every year when we go through our, our college career day event. Of those, we probably speak to one to 200. Of those, we invite in 16 to 24 for interviews. And of those, you know, we hire six to eight. You know, so those are the numbers. And for people to differentiate, like you said, that that topical experience is, is very important to help do that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, two things that you mentioned that, I mean, clearly based on the way we designed our program and the way that others are designing theirs um, has become mo more important than many other things, analytical ability. So if you, if you as a hiring manager break down what it means to be analytical, are you thinking about that in terms of the way in which you look at the Rubik's Cube and, and how you approach the problem? Are you looking at that in terms of raw math skills, comp sci skills? How, do, how are you thinking about what it means to be analytical as it relates to a prospective hire? Um, all the above. And so well, we, we want that mindset to be able or uh, that the, you, you mentioned the analytical approach to problem solving to be able to evaluate the results and what that means is walking for example walking into a distribution center touring the operation being a quick study understanding at a high level what it takes in that building to unload product receive it into a system put it away store it 
replenish a pick area, pick it, pack it, and ship it, and then take that and look at the numbers and see if the analytical numbers you're coming up with match what you saw. So that's a, a thought process. But more specifically, to be successful, what, what we found is that surprisingly few schools are teaching, and it's more recently, but still a lot less than we'd expect to have a focus on big data sets, um, even Excel, but more so SQL um, and preferably Python and R. Those types of skills to be able to get answers from the data as a, as a college grad on our projects, whether we're designing a network, uh, a, a supply chain network within the United States or one of those nodes, uh, meaning a distribution center or manufacturing plant, we're always asking for a lot of data. And the first task that a new hire will have is describe to us the company through the numbers. So tell the story of the operation through the numbers. So it's those two things, that, that mindset to look at it analytically and then the, the, the raw skills to be able to turn the numbers into a story and communicate it back to the, the, the client. And the reason that's such an important first step is they, you know, when you're consulting, you're somebody new, they're paying you a lot of money. Um, or even if you're just an internal engineer, I say just, but if you're an internal engineer working on a project, you need to communicate to the people you're delivering to that you understand how they're doing it first. Um, it's that that old book, Seek First to Understand Before Being Understood. You, you need to build that confidence. Do you at least understand their operation to the level that they will then trust you to make recommendations to improve it? So it's a critical first step um, in, in, in those numbers and the analytics. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I think so, because, you know, when, <clears throat> when, you, when you hear people say um, analytical, it's like asking somebody, you know, five different people what supply chain management is, and they'll give you seven different answers. So you ask somebody, you know, what does it mean to be analytical? Um, uh, you know, you can take it a number of different ways. So, you know, the the other thing that you touched on, which uh, really is hard for me to hear, uh, is that as it relates to the tools that you're looking for folks to know coming out of school, uh, R and Python are becoming more and more desirable. H how are you using those? Are you using those internally as a tool to provide insight, design, optimization, or are you seeing those being deployed uh, at the client site, and then your folks have to kind of train and, and work up the folks to, to teach them how to use R. How, how are you seeing those tools being deployed? So in the case of St. Ange Company, it's currently internally. And, you know, I'd love to say that it was strategic on my part or leadership's part to push forward, but it, we really fell into it in that we were using our old tools and approaches, a recent grad from our IT. Um, used Python and, you know, really impressed the senior engineers that he was working with and said, wow, you know, how'd you do that? And he explained it's Python. So then we pulled him off, put him on a separate project, took a tool and applied Python to it to make the tool more powerful. That then became um, a separate project to develop a new tool that then, and what the tool does is it looks at all the, the, the product in a pick area and does what we call slotting. So it puts it in the location that's most efficient for the operation. So it's a slotting tool that then not only does a one-time slotting, but takes into account real data feeds, runs through the same program, and then gives a new slotting um, file for, for consideration for operations. So it's, it, it's what I mentioned earlier, it, it's using data to make better informed business decisions. Uh, th those we're hoping uh, through an initiative, we got a new analytics team starting up, as I mentioned to you uh, yesterday, uh, Stephen, and we're, we're hoping to really raise the level of our tools and deliverables and roll those things out into client deliverables within the next year or two. Uh, currently, it's mostly for internal purposes, though. That's good to know. Um, so let's shift a little bit. Um, so that kind of, you know, if, if we're building a... Uh, uh, a house of supply chain hiring. We just hit probably the foundation and we're starting to put up, you know, the studs to build the walls. Let's think about how to prepare it for today and the way we're getting to, to belabor this metaphor even further. With COVID, with global disruptions, with chaos that's happening from edge to edge, 
how do you think that's going to impact your practice? And then following up to that, how do you think supply chain talent is going to have to adapt moving forward? Yeah, that's a common question we get asked these days, and it's already had a tremendous effect on the business. Obviously, 2020, our practice was affected like everybody's, but we managed to remain whole. 2021, we saw a tremendous rebound. So I think through 2020, what we saw was a lot of companies realizing the importance of supply chain, um, realizing that certain concepts were being challenged. And now at the end of 2021 and straight, you know, starting strong through the first quarter of 2022, we have more work than we can handle. And it's because supply chain is in the news and, and you know, what's changed? Well, things like just in time versus what we call just in case inventories. And, you know, just in time, the healthcare complexes and the national programs for just in time supplies of PPE equipment and people ran out because they didn't have enough on hand. And that's certainly a big topic in the, uh, the healthcare practice that we do. Um, the supply, the, the good or for good or bad supply chains in the headlines um, right now. And it, all prognostications that we hear is going to remain so through 2023 at least. The, the world demand for containers is way out of balance. The containers are in the wrong locations. A lot of that has to do with um, America's effect on the global su um, supply demand shifting of containers. And for whatever reason, um, they think it's going to take over a year to get that rebalanced um, because of the import export imbalances. And people have placed orders for more ships to bring stuff overseas, but those ships aren't set to hit the water until the first ones, I believe I heard uh, mid 2024, early 2025. So the, these issues aren't quick solutions that, that were unearthed through, through COVID. And um, you can just go on and on with the effects. The, the, we, we saw you know, in our world of building design, e-commerce had shown great growth, but it was still, you know, early on 10 years ago, it was only 2% of overall retail sales. And then it was 4%. Well, that's a doubling of e-com. That's huge on the e-com scale, but still very small in terms of retail. And then it bumped up, but it's still less than 20% of total retail sales, which to a lot of people seems hard to believe. But that says that there's a whole lot more growth in e-com and the resources for the current approach of supply chain are pretty much tapped out. Resources being, you know, the labor to pick, pack, and ship it. And so the industry is seeing a huge push right now, more so than I've, I've been in this since 1999. Um, way more interested in things like automation, robotics, things of that nature, just be, not to replace people, but just because they can't find people. And with the supply chain issues projected to go at least through 23, 24, until there's some kind of allevi alleviation internationally with um, demand not really projected to go down and the job market also i saw an economist say that it's the tightest job market in u.s history all things considered when you look equalizing it like it's not dollar cost averaging but the same concept in the labor market when you look at people in the workforce people um not in and the amount of jobs posted and available it's the tightest job market in u.s history so good news to you people on the call that are graduating soon i um, mean it's a great time to enter the uh the job market, you have you have all the leverage. I shouldn't have told you that, but um, it's a great time to enter the job market. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of a, a, a believe it or not, a short answer to that question. <laughs> oh, I, I don't doubt it. Um, you know, uh, the so I'm part of a team uh, that does the logistics managers index. We do a monthly survey every single month. We've been doing it for four and a half or five years now. And um, when COVID hit the we got the kind of the warning signal so to speak that this was going to get crazy and we we look at three different things we look at warehousing we look at capacity excuse me um uh inventory uh and we look at transportation and on both of those we look at pricing capacity and we say is it going to go up or is it going to go down it's a pretty simple thing and it's really robust but we have not seen uh an easing it's been in a contracting space for capacity and a uh, the demand for all of these services has been going up and up and up. 
So you take all of that, the data that we're getting from people that are feet on, you know, boots on the ground doing this stuff every day, coupled with the lack of talent to be able to go out there and do it. Um, it you know, it's no wonder inflation is what it is. It's no wonder all these things. So it's, it's really remarkable to hear it from your side of things because you're in warehouses every day trying to optimize and eke out, you know, 2% more capacity if that's possible, right? How much more juice can we squeeze from the orange? So what, what, what I'm kind of curious about then, um, and then maybe, by the way, I should mention this to everybody on the call. If you have questions that you'd like to ask Matt, uh, or if I can provide any value outside of stupid jokes, feel free to put uh, your questions inside the uh, chat. And then maybe in about five minutes or so, uh, I'll get to that. We can do a Q and A, uh, and we can we can kind of go through those. But uh, Matt, what I was going to ask you is, uh, if you're if you're looking at resumes uh, for people coming across, whether they're coming out of school, be it undergrad in supply chain or masters in supply chain, um, what kind of interesting double majors or minors have you seen that have been helpful to students, you know, I mean, I would think something along maybe uh, uh, some kind of managed information systems so that they can actually extract and pull information from the SQL servers and things like that. W what are you seeing? Is there any discipline in particular you think works particularly well uh, that you would be interested in hiring? Well, up till this year, that dual degree they put out um, in the industrial and systems engineering department has had a high level of success uh, with us, uh, with our um, new analytical group, we have started looking for information systems, um, MIS degrees, uh, data scientists, if you will. And so any combination, I, that's another reason I love the, the dual degree of the supply chain management, MIS um, background or, or, or combination, because it has the analytics with the, I guess, high level strategic thought process combined. And so that, that definitely in, in, intrigues me. Um, with what you're putting out, but those two, those two skills, anything STEM related, um, we we tend to hire uh, engineers uh, with uh, not not so many MBAs anymore. Even though that's I have an MBA with the industrial engineering, um, that that those two degrees, um, but that's not usually the accelerated dual degree combination. The MBA usually comes a little bit later. So yeah, those would be the two that that I've seen, and we we also see that that. The, the, the students out of the dual degree that take that extra year through the, you know, the, the accelerated program appear, they just seem to be doing significantly better in the process. They, they appear that one extra year just appears to mature the thought process significantly. I don't know why it could just be that our recruiter does a really good job, you know, figuring out what works at our company and screening it, but that we do seem to, to see those people have, have quite a bit of success. Yeah, it just kind of adds the the polish, right? With the extra year, that's you know. And by the way, my students on the call, I didn't pay him to say that. He he said that completely <laughs> independent of me. So I, I I wasn't lying to you when I told you this is the pitch to come join the the program. So well, this has been great. Um, uh, any concluding thoughts before we get into Q and A in terms of like um, you know, uh, any any key key things you'd like to communicate that maybe you haven't or. You know, if you, if you were to go back uh, to 1999, what would you tell yourself? Any any thoughts for the folks on the call that might be helpful? That's a, that's an interesting way to ask it too. And I, I covered a, a whole lot of the things that we look for. If I were to go back and and tell myself, um, you know, at that point in time, it, it's it's a different. You know, the full time job is a different mindset than school and. Uh, part of that mindset shift is when you get on that, that first job, um, you know, it, there's no more GPA. Uh, we, we just, we're looking for straight A's from everybody because the client's paying us for good answers. And a lot of, there's more, a lot of times there's more than one way to, to solve a problem. And, and that's great. But uh, take a little extra time, check the numbers, make sure that the work is accurate, correct. Spend a little extra time, work late to put on the polish. Um, really, if, you can separate yourself by working diligently and working hard. Um, and then I would say just do the hard work. And if you're in the right place, uh, you'll, all the rest of the good stuff will come to you. And, and I would say, don't, don't want everything up front. 
you know, some things take time. And so I, you know, when I first graduated, I was 27, 28, whatever it was for the first couple of years, pretty soon I thought I could run the building that I was working in. And then it wasn't until 10 years later that I found out how much I didn't know. And it seems the older I get, the more I, I realize I don't know. So, um, yeah, just soak it all in and learn as much as you can. Cause you can't, people can take a lot away from you, but they can't take away knowledge. They can't take away, you know, what you know and, and, and your experiences. That's a good way to frame it. And so for those of you who might've just joined on before we drive into, uh, um, into the Q and a, um, I think what I, what I would accentuate that Matt said that was really important is in the beginning, he, yeah, I asked him, what are the kind of the three things, or I didn't ask him the three things, but I said, what are the things that as a hiring manager uh, you're looking for? And he mentioned analytical ability broadly defined, which we kind of drilled into and said, that's um, the ability to kind of look at all different ways to solve a problem and being able to think it through. And, and I think he said, use the, define the business as it relates or through the numbers rather. So there was the analytical ability. There was the uh, intellectual curiosity, which I, I imagine in Matt's experience, they go hand in hand, right? The more curious you are, the better your analytical skills are and ability for you to define the, the problem. And then the full thing was um, communication ability, right? Being able to, and I assume that's both written and, and spoken, but uh, both of those two things. So, you know, all of that, I think I would, uh, I would accentuate as a really important thing, you know, because... Matt is a person who hires folks on a regular basis. So uh, those of you who are looking to get hired, I suspect those are, those are some key things. All right. So we've, we've got some questions and Matt, if I missed anything, tell me, I'm just going to take a look at the questions here. No, I think that's a good summary. And there's a really fine line between uh, confidence and arrogance and nobody likes a consultant that think that there are no at all. So we also ironically look for, humility and humbleness and uh, kind of a generous spirit, if you will. And it, it's, it's kind of a hard combination, but um, if you can combine confidence with humility, uh, you'll be really successful at our company. It's an interesting balance to strike, right? Because I think about that too. And if people talk about surgeons having a God complex, but I think about that, like, I don't know if I want uh, a non-confident surgeon. I don't want a surgeon to come in and be like, I don't know. I, I think we'll figure this out. We'll, we'll probably get through this. It ought to be fine. Right. But it's the same thing. You don't want them to come in and completely belittle you. Right. So I guess you're, you're saying the same thing as it relates to consultants who are coming in supposed to basically know everything, but at the same time, not, not hit that arrogance, which is probably a, a, a good, good point to note. Okay. Yeah. There, there's a baseline. You have to know the topic. You have to know your client. You have to put in the extra work. One of the values we look for is hard work. And it takes time um, because you do have to put in that effort and then you get the confidence by knowing the topic. And, and yeah. that's not saying, you know, so confidence doesn't mean going in there, sticking your chest out and being a know-it-all confidence comes from knowing the subject matter cold, having done extra work, gone through it, knowing the key talking points, that'll give you the confidence to then have the assurance to say you don't know or to ask more questions because you're confident in the uh, information that you do have. Yep. No, that's a good point. Good point. Okay. So the first question is from uh, Vikas who's saying, uh, are you specifically looking for R in Python? Would knowledge, knowledge of Tableau help? Um, thinking about things like a, uh, uh, you know, ERP implementation and different verticals uh, would, would things like that help to secure a job in supply chain? So specifically R and Python, yes. What about Tableau? And then any ERP system experience, how might that, how might that benefit the uh, applicant? So you're really going to push the, uh, I'll get out of school here quickly on these things. Cause when I did my data analytics in those years, it was a lot of Excel and access. But um, I, no, I, I do know that, yes, um, Python specifically, and we use Python more than R, to be honest with you, um, but they're both useful, but, but Python specifically. Things like ERP system implementations, I didn't mention, but within our uh, supply chain strategy group, we have a whole systems group. It's a smaller group, but they do warehouse management system implementations, warehouse management selections, ERP selections, transportation management system selections, and so their, their job is to, to know the, the, the supply chain systems 
industry very well and be able to make those uh, system recommendations to our clients. So all of that will certainly show well on a resume um, with, with a company like ours. Do you, as far as those systems implement, I mean, do you run across like um, one more than the other? Do you do more SAP than Oracle or is it just kind of, you're really not looking for brand specific more along the lines of deploying or having a knowledge of deploying the systems is more important. We do want to, I mean, there's a lot of options out there and we do want to be the best or, or most well-versed in the tier one suppliers. Uh, like you had mentioned, SAP is certainly one of the largest ones. And over the last decade or so, they had gobbled up some warehouse management systems. And so they all kind of roll into the same package. And when you can have a, a WMS with the same ERP, obviously the APIs and connections are more evolved and so it's better. Uh, but we don't, mm -hmm. another thing I didn't mention, a, a core business philosophy of St. Ange Company is vendor agnostic, which means that we don't have any preferred hardware or software suppliers. Our whole job is to act in the best interest of our client and help them select the system that's the best value for them. And so a warehouse management system like Manhattan Associates is probably the clear leader, especially in retail, but there are some 3PLs or third-party logistics providers they think they want Manhattan because it would help them sell to the widest uh, client base, but the total cost of ownership really doesn't make sense for them. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So um, that kind of follows up into uh, Paul's question. Uh, so Paul's question is around uh, att having attended a conference on competitive intelligence, uh, saying that competitive intelligence was a major benefit uh, in digging out interconnection points uh, that data do not identify. Have you or your firm used competitive intelligence skills to supplement any secondary data? I gotta be honest, competitive intelligence is a, uh, that's a new term to me. Um, I played sports my whole life. And so I, I'm pretty well acquainted with competition and uh, wanting to win and all those good things. But uh, competitive intelligence, I'm not sure what that means. We we do use what we call emotional intelligence and uh, kind of the, the, the ability to see the world through other people's eyes as part of our analysis and recommendations. But um, as far as competitive intelligence, if it looks at the interconnectivity of data that's not specifically called out through data, we would call that correlation. Um, and we do um, what we call big data analytics. And I the theory would be that correlations and, and big data analytics will antiquate the scientific approach, meaning the scientific approach is you come up with a hypothesis, you get, get a data set, you cleanse the data, you look for the, you rule out the outliers, you analyze it and see if your output matched your hypothesis and then you draw your conclusions. The big data would say there is no bad data, you just take it all, look for how different variables interact and project out predictions or correlations. And that's part of what our new team, what I want them to get into. Um, most of our tools currently, they're powerful, but most of them, what I call rear view mirror tools. So it's looking at historical data and describing the performance of the company. And then um, assuming that with certain assumptions on top, future performance will be like past performance. Um, what we're starting to evolve uh, with Python and other tools is, is more in the predictive analytics and trying to look at these large data sets, draw correlations and interdependencies and show which way the industry is going. So that's in our, our three to five year roadmap. That's good to know. Um, geez, a lot of questions coming through. Uh, so, um, okay, uh, Matt Hurry, your question is about the uh, master's program. So I'm not gonna address that here because I want to uh, use Matt's time wisely. So you can email me separately and we can talk about that. Uh, okay, so Attila's got a couple questions here. Uh, two questions for Matt. One, what are some challenges uh, new employees face when coming to and integrating in with your company? And two, what challenges do you face uh, when doing consultancy with your business partners? any pitfalls which you are aware of before beginning such projects? Great question. So number one, integrating new employees. Number two, pitfalls in terms of consulting that you've experienced. The 
when, when new people come and integrate into our our company, uh, that's a I mentioned that I was EVP and managing partner. I talked about the EVP part. The managing partner means that I also have dotted lines to human resources, our recruiter, things like recruiting and retention. And so that's kind of what keeps me up at night is retaining our people and integrating in the onboarding process. We've got initiatives to look at that. So it's a very timely question. Uh, certainly the last couple of years with COVID, working from home integration has been more and more difficult. Uh, we we started when we started our company. Everyone came to York, Pennsylvania, in the corporate headquarters. We then had to evolve as we opened offices in Dallas and Jacksonville. We then had to evolve as we allowed people to work remotely. Um, but all that was good because it kind of prepared us for COVID. And then to finally answer your question, I think some of the challenges that the people have are coming into the office and having a lot of their team remote or working from home and having to communicate like we are now with video. We've gotten a lot better at it through COVID, but it's still to me not the same as the, the in-person connections that are made. Um, also, I think the what I mentioned earlier, the desire, some people have a desire to rush to get results to impress. So the desire to impress isn't a bad thing, but when you rush to get results done and don't check your numbers and it's wrong, it's really better to take the extra amount of time to get the right answer than a fast wrong answer. And so that, and, and then that transition from school where, you know, a B is good enough, my GPA is okay, I'll still get a job. Not that anyone thinks that way, but some might. Um, two, when you're on the job, every client's important and every result has to be done well and if you you know five o'clock comes up you might need to stay till five thirty six o'clock to finish what you're doing it's not good enough until you follow the thought process all the way through so off the top of my head those are some things that uh people are uh, find challenging we certainly try to to kind of sift through those types of things in the interview process so we don't have a lot of that anymore but it's still a, a it can be a challenge. And for myself, um, when doing consultancy with your business partners, are there pitfalls you're already aware of? Um, I, I, I've been saying something for, for decades and it's, it's with a bunch of engineers, we're, we're primarily generally introverted and uh, communication is not our favorite thing and talking especially, right? So uh, when I took my role in, in 2017, I put in things like one-on-ones and forced communication. I think the biggest pitfalls that our clients, the problems we're solving and our own company, I'd say 90% or more are communication related, whether it's a lack of communication, wrong communication, miscommunication, um, I mean, you name it, uh, bad communication, whatever. So uh, I think that's the, the biggest pitfall is, is not communicating enough, uh, not communicating clearly enough, and then um, not being, and communication is two ways. It's speaking, but it's also listening. And then so possibly the uh, the biggest pitfall are getting a bunch of insecure type A's that we tend to be um, to listen to each other, process it, and then, you know, have a good communication. I think those are the, the pitfalls that we've been, been working on. It's easy to be critical. We're pretty good at it, but uh, those are the, the pitfalls that are potentials. All right. So let's see. I'm going to do... Uh... Uh, Brian's question because he's got a two-part question. Um, part one is what type of opportunities are there at sea and inland ports in the United States as part of supply chain? And also what type of opportunities in supply chain are detail-oriented, jobs that require attention to detail and catching issues before everyone? I haven't found a non-detail-oriented supply chain job. That, that'd be an interesting. I'd be curious to hear your response on that. It's a good question, Brian. <laughs> um, good question. I don't know about any uh, non-detail-oriented entry jobs. Uh, certainly, the uh, <clears throat> as you get up to the higher levels of companies and they're just trying to think more strategic, I people think that they're not detail-oriented. Um, what I've found is they 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 often are very much detail-oriented. It's just bigger bigger details more of them and more assumptions, but you're still trying to apply a logical thought process even around a bunch of assumptions and prognostications. 
but anyway, at, at the sea and the inland ports, uh, there, there's there's port capacity issues, as I think everyone's aware of, um, and working with uh, deconsolidation centers is another area of opportunity. Um, import breakdown centers, where you're, you're um, the, the uh, uh, trade free zones, <laughs> where you're breaking down and then loading up trucks and, and sending them out to stores within the, the U.S. are all opportunities. There are a couple. Um, every, every trade show I go to, there's some economic development groups that come up to our booth and they want us to help them develop their cities uh, because they want to be new ports of entry and they want to know how to compete with some other ports. So economic development companies are another um, um, area of opportunity um, in, in those areas you're talking about. And then what was the second question? Oh, it was about uh, which jobs are, are detail oriented in the supply chain. Oh. Yeah, I think I, uh, yeah, I think I answered that one. But uh, anything you know with with <clears throat> network supply chain planning, that's detail oriented. Running the models, um, you, you, even the purchasing is detail oriented. As you look for managing your margins, um, vendor selections are not necessarily engineering, but there's a lot of data. Into that decision making for vendor selection, sourcing decisions. Um, there's certainly a lot of analytics around inventory management. That's another area of uh, the interest in it is increasing. We're seeing a lot more requests for inventory management because that's tied up working capital, right? If you buy too much stuff and you don't sell it, that money could have been used to open a new store or a new plant or anything else. <clears throat> so that's another area within the supply chain that's that's analytical. It's off the top of my head. Awesome, yeah. Um, and then the last question, and then we can see if there's any one or two left, but probably button it up. Uh, how many students do you normally hire from RIT for a co-op? Do you typically hire interns for co-ops? Yeah, the unfortunate answer to that is zero. Um, we, I, I want to, uh, but but I always, because every time we recruit, they ask about internships and co-ops um, at all the different schools. And um, I always give the same answer that we used to do it, you know, years ago, 20 years ago. We don't now, um, but it's on the list of um, initiatives I'd like to do. Uh, what's holding me back is I want to make sure that we have a good project. Um, I, I went through the co-op program. I heard stories of people. I was lucky enough to have good co-ops with meaningful work but I don't want people just coming in doing data entry. I, I want it to be meaningful, part of something big. And our onboarding process is, is probably four to six months. And so when we used to be on the quarter system, I know it's semesters now, but it used to be the quarter system, you know, three months was not a lot of time. And so we, we need something where we can get people trained and contribute and come to some kind of conclusion in a meaningful project. So that's the short answer. The, uh, the reason why we no longer have them is a little more entertaining, but maybe we'll do that for a different day. Absolutely. Well, maybe we've got time for uh, uh, one more question. If anybody wants to throw that burning question into the chat. Um, in the meantime, I just want to say thanks so much, Matt. This was, I mean, the turnout was phenomenal. Uh, this was really great. And, um, you know, uh, it's always nice hearing uh, from your perspective, you know, the, the way I look at it, and I tell anybody who, who wants to talk to me about it, my philosophy is that my students are my prod, uh, products. They're coming through my assembly line. I'm tooling them and getting them ready for the consumer, which is you, to, to buy them and then utilize all their talent and education, right? So they're coming through that assembly line. And, and this is good to hear that, you know, the voice of the customer, as it were, uh, what you're looking for. So this has been really great. This has been really great. Any other? Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say thank you for, for having me. I'll do it anytime. I, I love information sessions like this. I, I like the dialogue. I can talk about this kind of thing. It doesn't make me real popular at happy hours, but in, a, in a, an interested group, it's always fun to talk to an interested group. So uh, be happy to do it anytime. So let's do one last question from David. Uh, so how is your work today impacted by the influx of clients planning for higher investment versus greater automation? Ah, interesting. Good question, David. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah, I, I was going to say they're the same thing, but it's via greater in automation. So um, our work today is being 
impacted in a very positive manner would be the, the short answer. There's a lot of, you know, it's what we do. It's our, been our sweet spot since 1989. Um, it wasn't always popular. Um, warehousing wasn't always a focus, but now um, there is a lot of demand for what we do. So it was, you know, it's a good life lesson, you know, do a good job when no one's looking so that you're prepared to do a good job when everyone's looking. And um, that's where we're at now. We have more work than we can, than we can handle. And as, as I mentioned earlier, um, it seems like, you know, I speak at conferences or when I go to um, some client events, I, what I like to say is that for the last three, four years, everyone wants to disrupt their industry with innovation using robots. So those are the disruption, innovation, and robots are the buzzwords that always come up. And uh, people are even being more blatant about it now that, you know, I want to, I want as many robots as possible. And, you know, part of our job is to un understand the robotic industry and educate our clients on which um, companies are ready for the scale they're asking for and which aren't, because quite honestly, most aren't right now, but, but so many want them that there's even a, a shameless company that I met at the conference that was called themselves Voodoo Robotics and they sold Pictolite systems. So they didn't even have robots, <laughs> but they, they got interest in their, their company name with the robotics tag. So that's how popular automation robotics are right now. Yeah, that's a whole nother uh, branch of, of AI that's really interesting, optimizing the back end of those systems on the on the pick and pack and um, the warehouse automation, but that could be a whole separate uh, separate webinar. And, and I have to go and lecture to some of the folks that are on this call right now. So uh, Matt, thank you so much for your time. This was phenomenal. Uh, to all those who are uh, here and might have joined a little bit later uh, this recording, because I definitely remembered to record it. Uh, this recording is going to be sent out to everybody uh, and, uh, and, and to those who registered. So thank you. Uh, I look forward to continuing to speak with anybody. I want to thank St. Ange and thank the Masters in Global Supply Chain Management Program for sponsoring this. And uh, hope you all have a great day. Last thing I'll do is say thank you to the interpreters. Uh, I know I speak too fast and say too much. So thanks for keeping up and thanks for being with us. Thank you. No problem. Absolutely. Bye, everybody.